God bless you. Our God is great. And, great. and he is greatly to be praised. Come on, put those hands together. Give God some praise. How we thank God for another day's journey. Amen. Another day's journey, and I'm glad about it. You often hear me say, I'm glad to be alive. There's no place I'd rather be than alive. And if you have any other suggestions, you can keep them to yourself. Because I thank God for being alive. We are uh, just excited to have uh, in our presence this afternoon one of God's uh, great preachers. I, I tell you, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, this man is uh, not only appointed to preach, but he's definitely been anointed to preach. And we're glad to have him in our city on today. And we're certainly glad to have him here uh, at Second Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, let me first and foremost introduce uh, Reverend Guy out of Muskegon, uh, Michigan. Give Reverend Guy a real big hand. We're glad to have him as well. And we're glad to have our very special guest, Reverend Tellus Chapman, out of Detroit, Michigan. Amen. Uh, and I'm not going to uh, waste any time. I'm not going to use him any time now. He's going to come now. Let's give him a big, mighty Mount Olive uh, Chicago welcome. Pastor Chapman, come on, give him a real big hand. I need to take you all back to Detroit with me. <laughs> Honorable Pastor Dr. Giles, and to our friend and brother and nephew, Amen. Reverend Guy, and, and to this uh, great uh, cadre of people gathered in this place today, Amen. celebrating the resurrection. I thank God for this privilege, which is indeed precious and priceless, to share with you in this setting as we gather for worship, witness, and work. I want to say thank you to Dr. Freeman for orchestrating this and for Pastor Giles and the Mount Olive family for hosting us and receiving us with such fire and fervor Amen. and with such friendly spirit. And thank God for kindred minds and kindred spirits as we endeavor uh, to go about the nation to garner support for the work of Baptists throughout this United States. And that we may be led in the right direction with integrity and dignity and class Amen. and deportment. Amen. I trust that we make the right choice for the right leadership. I stand in the place of my friend and brother and leader and soon to be president of our great convention, Dr. Jerry Young, one who is more than capable of giving leadership to Baptists right. around this nation. Amen. And I say that because he has the head for it. Right. Intelligent, prepared, learned, trained, adept, astute, dexterous, he is more than able to handle it because I've seen him at work. He is the only candidate, and you can share this with any other person or pastor who identify with National Baptist. He is the only candidate in the race who has had firsthand training and experience to lead the convention in that he served under Dr. William J. Shaw for 10 years as first vice president. That's being on the inside, knowing all of the nuances of the convention, not being a novice. He has served five years as the first vice at large under Reverend Dr. Julius Richard Scrubs. That means he's not a novice, but he's been on the inside and knows the nuances of convention. This is not a time for a novice to occupy an office like that. 
but someone who can bring the experience to the position. Not only does he have the head for it, he has the home to represent it. All right. And this is no offense to any preacher anywhere in, on the planet, but if you really want to know whether or not a person can handle things away from home, look at what they're doing at home. And on these stages in these national conventions, a lot of preachers walk real heavy. But if you follow them home, you'd almost go to cry. That's not to demean them, belittle them, or disparage their character. It is to say that some people do not have the wherewithal at home to bag them up away from home. And Brother Young has served as president of the General Baptist State Convention. He has a tremendous following in Jackson, Mississippi, and he is in the process of building a multi-million dollar, not building, not church, but campus. He's already running uh, a school that is accredited in the state of Mississippi, A-rated, and has a waiting list for some year or better. I'm saying this cannot be said about any other candidate in race. And lastly, beloved, he has the heart for the convention. Here is what we need, Dr. Giles. Not a new face for the convention, but a new focus. And Dr. Young's focus is to move the convention from convention to denomination. And until you change people's thinking, you will not change their action. And if you want their actions to change, change their thinking. If you've ever seen a rodeo, you notice there are horses that are corralled and lassoed, and then there is a rider on a horse. Well, the horse that's being ridden is of a different spirit than the horse that's being lassoed. That's right. And the horse that's lassoed is a horse that still has a wild spirit. Amen. That's why when they are ridden, they buck and they try to throw off the rider. And they will keep doing that. And all of a sudden, they calm down. And allow the rider to tell them G or Ha. If you're from the country, you know what G and Ha mean. War and idiot. If you're from Chicago, you don't hurt yourself. <laughs> you want to know why that horse calms down? Is because that wild spirit at that point has been broken. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the only way. The horse has its spirit broken is because the rider was determined to stay on it and change its thinking. If I can get away with saying that an animal can think, certainly if they know grain and corn and where to find water, that says something about their instinct. If the convention will move from conventionalism to denomination, is going to take a leader that can change our thinking. Amen. When you see the Church of God in Christ anywhere, you see their logo on their books, on their hymnals, on their buildings. You don't see the National Baptist Convention logo anywhere with the exception of a letterhead. We need identity around this nation. All our churches, all our hymn books. You can give God some praise for that. And when people pass by our properties, they will know that that church identifies as National Baptist. We need regional representation. That is, our headquarters is in Nashville, Tennessee. But what about the needs of those in Chicago, in Illinois, Wisconsin? and surrounding areas. 
There is a need for regional representation so that whatever the needs of churches are, they have a local or regional entity to whom and to where they can go to address their concerns and observations. This is where the Reverend Dr. Jerry Young is. We need social justice impact. Trayvon Martin was shot by a wannabe cop right. Right. named George Zimmerman. Yeah. And while we were buying hoodies to protest around the nation, we were not mindful of the fact that we were getting other folk rich by buying hoodies that they made and sold and who didn't put not one dime in our pockets. When there are issues, our presence need to be felt, our voice need to be heard as Baptists. When Supreme Court justices are being appointed, you have Southern Baptists, you have them at their hearing, you have people like Rick Warren, who is non-denominational, having debates, presidential debates, at his church, and you mean to tell me that we are eight million strong and cannot demand a hearing between individuals who have run this nation? This is what denomination will do for us when we move from getting new faces to concentrating on a new focus so that we can move from convention to denomination. We need your help to share this word with fellow pastors and preachers like your pastor and others in this city like the Marvin Wilders and others, Dr. George Wallace, who are with us in support of what we're trying to do with our National Baptist Convention. I know we can count on a Reverend Giles and a Mount Olive. Yeah. Amen. But you need others who haven't quite been convinced yet. Yes. If you are asked, well, what is he gonna do? If you could say it with concision, tell him he wants to take us All right. from convention to denomination. All right. So that whenever social issues and social justice issues face our community, we can call that regional representative to make sure that we're in the street, boots on the ground, leading the march and the protest, putting pressure on government so that we can get justice in our community. That goes for your streets that has to be serviced and covered. It goes for your garbage being picked up. That goes for your school district. We can make an impact on this. We buy Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Fago, Lay's, all of these things, where are our people? Do our people sit on the, on the policy making uh, positions on, in these factories and in these companies? And it's just like the Alpine Mountains, you start on the ground floor, you got Pookie buying a bag of potato chips, but by the time you get at the top of the potato chip company, it's Lily White. And the higher you go, the wider it gets. If we can buy potato chip, we can sit in position to tell the potato chip company how we want the company to run. This is what denomination will do for you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can stand here all day and campaign, but your pastor and others have invited me to say a word from the Lord. Every head bowed. God our Father, we thank you now for this day, for the love you've shown us, for the gift you've given us, for the privilege to pray and praise your name and certainly participate on your agenda. Thank you for this gathering. It is already successful because these, your people, are here. Amen. You receive your glory. This is our prayer. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I asked these preachers to give me a sermon. They wouldn't do it. <laughs> and only have but a few minutes but for what little time I have left, and pardon my early exits, I'm waving, I'm saying goodbye, I'm gonna hug you all, and, and, and thank you for having me. Uh, but I have to make an early exit to catch a flight to get back uh, uh, to the Detroit area. The 15th chapter of the book of Mark, 
Mm -hmm. uh, there is something uh, that strikes my spirit that I want to share with you today during this Lenten season. Mark the 15th chapter, beginning with the 33rd and the 34th verse. Yes, sir. Our Lord's Gospel is recorded by Mark the 15th chapter, verses 33 and 34. Here is how it reads in the New King James Version. Mm -hmm. Now, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yes. Turn to your neighbor left or right. If you're not anti-social, shake your hand. Tell them these words. Neighbor, neighbor. the enemy, the enemy. Can't, win. can't win. Give right. God some praise before we get rid of it. I'll tell you more. Thank you. It was during the presidential debate between then Senator Barack Obama and Senator John McCain that this exchange took place during their debate on foreign policy. All right, all right. Barack Obama having stated that as a leader of the free world, he would like to sit down and talk with his enemies to try to make peace throughout the world. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. right. Senator McCann's retort was, I wish we could sit down and talk with our enemies, but I'm afraid that this is not the kind of world in which we live. And beloved, it turns out that John McCain is still the senator. <laughs> Barack Obama is a two-time president. And his disposition is yet to come to fruition in that it bespeaks the realization mm -hmm. that we do have an enemy. All right. All right. And in the real world, our enemy is not really some red-suited, forked-tailed, pitchfork-carrying, horn-protruding terrorizer of society. They come in all shapes and sizes. There was a time when they rode horseback and wore hoods. Now they wear Hickey Freemans and Stacy Adams. <laughs> Albert Nippons and St. John's of New York. They occupy public office with the stroke of your destiny in the ink of their pen. They, they re-line districts and they indulge in new photo registration laws and procedures all in the indicative of the fact that they serve as our apparent enemy. But if there is any encouragement to you today, if you would be inspired, if you would be encouraged at all, I stop by to tell you, on my way to heaven, the enemy cannot win. Oh, we got some enemies. When you've got white men who has such a disaffection and distaste for rap music, they can shoot our teenagers and find jurors to let them off the hook. We got some enemies. 
When you got the likes of Papa Dean, the million dollar chef who can steal grandmama's recipe, make millions of dollars frying her chicken and calling her the N word all at the same time, we got some enemies. When you got a house of Congress who can shut the government down to the tune of $24 billion, put 8,000 people out of work all because they can't handle color in the White House, tell your neighbor, we got you in it. But, despite the presence and plans of I tell your neighbor, he can't win. And we have a perfect paradigm to prove the point. We have an excellent example on exhibit on a hill called Calvary over 2,000 years ago that says whatever the enemy has strategized to do, he still can't win. He thinks he can. And he thought he did. When he had Jesus pinned to a wood beam on a rugged crest of Calvary, driven nails in each palm, a spike in both feet, a spear in one side, a thorny crown on his head, too small but forced their own, and with a blood matted body and a dehydrated throat, the enemy thought he had him when he said, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? That sounds like defeat. That sounds like retreat. That sounds like one who has given in, given up, given out, given down, and have given over way the white flag and said, I can't do this. But you need to look a little deeper. Because enveloped and intrinsicate in the words of Jesus Christ is nothing but victory. Can I tell you how I know? Jesus Christ, having been pinned to a cross, he's died, and Mark says he died, and darkness covered the face of the earth from the sixth to the ninth hour. At the time when the sun was to have been at its peak and meridian strength, as it tiptoed its way across the vaulted dome, excused itself, and the cloak of darkness was pulled over the stage of Calvary, and there was total darkness from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the day. Go ahead, go ahead now. And here is how Jesus handled the darkness to defeat the enemy. In that he indicates that the enemy can't win because vision does not determine victory. You didn't feel me. You see, Dr. Child, darkness is nothing new to the Lord. They didn't feel no more left side. Let me try my right side. Darkness is nothing new. Matter of fact, before God said, let there be light, he already created the heavens and the earth in the dark. Light, nor darkness, does not matter to God because light does not facilitate the vision of God because even though darkness had availed the earth, the plans of God were still going on. And beloved, if you don't think God can work in the dark, look at what he had done before he did what he did in Genesis 1, having made the world, and then said, let there be light. And by the time light got here, the world was already here. Vision does not determine our victory uh -huh. because we are riding and walking on what he said and not on what we see. All right, all right. Yes, sir. I hear you now. 
Because a lot of times, Dr. Guy, uh -huh. what he said, you're not going to readily see. But by the time you see it, you will say, that's what he said. <laughs> and if you don't think that what he said will ever happen, look at what he said when he said what he said the first time he ever said what he said. When he said, let there be all there was that was to become what it is, became what it is, simply because he said, let there be. So since I can't see, I'm just going by what he said. Talk to me, somebody. Since, since, since I don't see it grow open, I'm just going by what he said. Since the window hasn't opened yet, I haven't seen it, but he said he's going to open the window of heaven and pull me out a blessing that I won't have room to receive. I wish I had time to stay here. You can't go by what you see. And if you don't see it before you see it, you ain't going to see it. You got to go by what it is. You want to know how I know the enemy can't win? It's because convenience does not determine our communication. Do you not know the Lord answers prayer? Won't he do it? Luke 18 1 says, Man ought to always pray and not faith. Philippians 4 6 says, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Make your request be made known unto God. James 5 15 says, The prayer of faith shall save the sick. James 5 16 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. Jeremiah 33 and 3 says that God says, call me and I'll hear you and I'll answer you and I'll show you great and mighty things. If you forget any words I just quoted, go back and get none of them theology because Nana said, Jesus is on the main line. Call him up and tell him what you want. And when we do convey our innermost feelings to God in prayer, is it indicates that our circumstance does not determine our supplication. Jesus is hanging on Calvary, and out of all the pain and agony, it does not affect his communication with God. Oh, praise his name. He still talk to God. And if you really want to see a child of God, talk to God, put a child of God back against the wall. And they will remind you that they do not have situational theology. In that, in that when they pray out of good times, it's thinking. And when they pray out of wrong time, they thank you ahead of time. Good friend of mine, Dr. Melvin Wade, tells a story, and I quit. Go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Of an old grandmother who raised a granddaughter and who frequented the house of God. And she would always be heard, or was always heard to say on Sunday, Oh, Lord, thank you. Every Sunday, yes, all throughout the service, old lady said, Oh Lord, thank you. Right. And one day, somebody decided to get a couple people together and go and approach her about saying all the time, Oh Lord, oh, Lord. thank you. Yes, Why do you say that all the time? She said, I'm glad you asked me that. <laughs> she said, Really? The Lord is all I got. You see me raising my grand young by myself and it's hard to try to make ends meet. She said, when I go in the kitchen and there's not much to cook with, I say, oh Lord. But by the time the table is set and we got something to eat, I tell them thank you. 
When we lay down at night, we hear gunshots sounding all around us. And sirens going before I go to bed. I said, oh yeah. But then when I wake up in the morning and know that all my baby has come upon us, I tell you, thank you. My grandbaby goes out of his house, walk down dangerous streets to get to school. I can't be with her all day. I just say, oh, Lord. But by the time she walks back in the house and she's all right, I tell him, thank you. Shake somebody's head and tell him, I've got to say, oh, Lord. And when God makes a way, i got to tell him, thank you. That's why the enemy can't win. Can't win. Can I just share just one more thought with you? I, I should have been making my exit a few minutes ago. But, but, but I need to tell you that, that the enemy cannot win. Because agony does not determine our association. Jesus said, my God, hold it, you miss me. He said, my God, you still didn't catch it, did you? Even though he was hanging, he still said, my God. Even though he was bleeding, he still said, I followed my father one night to the hospital. Uh, of course, he was a pastor in town. And um, a lady's baby had died. And they called for my father. And for whatever reason, I always tagged along behind him. And uh, made our way to the hospital. Stepped off the elevator. The family had gathered in the hallway. And the mother was at the doorway. Had a handkerchief clutched to her cheek. Naturally weeping in that her baby died. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And before my father could turn the corner to get into the room. She held out her hand and gestured for him to stop. She said, she said, Reverend Chapman, don't come in to me tonight. Don't come in here with all that God stuff. I don't want to hear it tonight. Well, well, all right. She don't, don't say nothing to me about God. Where was God when my child died? Tell it, tell it. And my father never broke a stride. He said, baby, he's in the same place he was when his child died. The enemy can't win because God is still our God. I don't care what chapter set, what tricks are made, what pitfalls may befall you. God is still your God. Can I give you a word of encouragement and I take my seat? Be not dismayed. Whatever the time, God will. Take care of you. Beneath his wings. Under the arm of the body. God will. Take care of you. Every day. And all the way. God will. Or just shake one last hand. And tell him God will. Take care of you. Whatever your challenge is. God. God, God will. Come on, give God praise. So Pastor tell us Chapman, come on, you can do better than that. Pastor tell us Chapman. Detroit, Michigan. What a word, what a word. Would you bow your head for a moment while you're still standing? Oh, uh, it's nothing like a good lunch. Uh, featuring the word of God. Amen. Uh, praise God. The enemy cannot win. Father God, in the name of Jesus, how we thank you. We thank you for that word from your man of God. We thank you not only for the messenger, we certainly thank you for the message. Uh, for a word that reminds us, that encourages us, that the enemy cannot win. In spite of what we're going through, the enemy cannot win. Thanks to the actions of your son on the cross, the enemy cannot win. We pray now in the name of Jesus uh, that those who have been able to hear this word, uh, that they are blessed by the word. Perhaps someone felt like not going on, 
felt discouraged, and felt like throwing in the towel or giving up, we thank you, God, for this word. Let that word be a word of encouragement, a word to inspire, a word to lift up and say that they can make it because we can do all things through Christ who died on the cross for us and who now strengthens us. Bless Pastor Chapman. Oh God, even now restore the virtue that was lost uh, as he delivered your word. We pray now, oh God, that even as he makes his way back to his home, uh, that you will cover him in your blood and surround your arms around him and allow him to get back safely and find everyone and everything as well as they were before he left. I thank you for the men and women who are here. And I pray, oh God, in the name of Jesus, a blessing from you as only you can. We stand in the need of a blessing. And we want to say, oh Lord. And then we want to say thank you. These blessings we ask. Uh, in the name of Jesus, we ask that uh, your grace the love of your son, Jesus the Christ, sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide now henceforth and forevermore. Let every heart say together, amen. amen. God bless you. We're done.